We're going to be dealing with some really amazing things this morning, but I also recognize they can be incredibly painful as well. And so I would like to start out in this fashion. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you have been ready to just simply cry out, I can't take it any longer? Have you been? I, I, boy, I'll tell you, this is really interesting from this viewpoint. I see people rolling their eyes, shaking their heads, throwing their heads back, lowering their heads, dropping their jaws. Uh, my guess is we've probably all been there. I just can't take it any longer. You know what is especially difficult? Is when the stuff that we have to take is coming from people we love. Probably nothing more painful than that than having to take all sorts of garbage from people you love, people who are actually somehow looking at you as the enemy. Have you ever been there? Where suddenly the people that you had given your loyalty to, the people that you had honored, the people you enjoyed and blessed are suddenly out to get you. And you think, what is going on here? And you come to that point where you're ready to cry out to God or you come to that point where you do cry out to God and you say, I can't bear it any longer. This morning, we're going to talk about forbearance. Forbearance. Again, it's interesting to look at your faces. It's not a word we use very frequently, is it? In fact, that's where we're going to put the definition up here on the screen. Forbearance means restraint in the face of provocation. It means patient endurance. And when I think of that kind of patient endurance and that kind of restraint in the face of incredible provocation, I have a hard time coming up with any account in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, better than the one we're going to look at today. So would you open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 24, and we're going to talk this morning about forbearance. But before we do, I really believe we need to pray. And we need to pray for some very specific things. One of them is that as we talk about these issues this morning, I know we are probably removing the scabs from a lot of painful wounds. And If there is a wound that has bothered you and affected you for a long time, then let's pray that God will speak to that wound this morning and bring his healing balm to a wound that may have just been scratched or that, quite frankly, may be wide open. I also recognize as we talk about these things this morning that it will bring to mind people Maybe there is someone who has hurt you deeply. Perhaps it's a long-lost friend. Perhaps it's a member of your own family. Perhaps it's even someone in the family of God. And when we have been deeply wounded, that pain can eat away at our soul. And one of the things the enemy loves to do is he loves to focus our attention on the pain rather than on the healer. And so this morning, we're going to ask God that he thwart the plans of the enemy to focus on our pain and instead to look to him who brings healing and hope, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's come before him in prayer, and then let's look at this story, okay? Father, you know us. You know us inside and out. You know the secret needs of our lives, the inner cries that come from our our lips and from our souls, even in the darkest night. You know our pain. You know our suffering. You know the issues that we are each struggling with. And so we pray this morning, Lord, that you would bring your healing balm into our lives. In those areas where we are deeply hurt, where we have been greatly wounded, may your Holy Spirit minister to us at the very deepest levels to bring hope and joy, peace and healing, even in the face of opposition. 
Lord, as you also bring to mind people in our lives, individuals who may have hurt us, who may still be hurting us, individuals who seem to have made it their life goal to make our lives miserable. Lord, may we concentrate not on the misery, but instead concentrate on you who bore our sins and our diseases, our hurts and our wounds. May we find strength not in rehearsing the wrongs, but rather in looking to him who is pure and holy and good, Jesus our Savior. Speak to our hearts now this morning, Lord. and Speak to us in a way that will bring great peace and remarkable healing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now let's talk about the fun stuff. We, we've scratched the wounds, removed the scabs, but now here's the rest of the story. 1 Samuel chapter 24. You recall, if you were with us last week, we took a look at that great account of David going up against Goliath. But we've just skipped a bunch of chapters, and I'd like to kind of give you a quick overview of what happened then in, in chapters 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. And the answer is, King Saul did everything he possibly could to bring David down. The hero of Israel, the one who pulled Saul's bacon out of the fire, has now become Saul's enemy. He throws spears at him. He hires hit men to take him out. He gets his own son, David's best friend, and says, why don't you bring him down? He tries to arrange for the Philistines to kill him. Saul does everything to destroy David. No one can look at the scriptures and say, the great heroes of the Bible just don't understand what life is really like. Because no matter what you or I may have gone through in our lives, I doubt very seriously that we can hold a candle to what David had to endure. He lived as a hunted man. And I mean, he started out so well. He started out the hero. He was, well, I, may I use the phrase? He was a rock star. After that after that slingshot with Goliath. I mean, that's what he was. They even sang songs about him. We don't know the melodies. We do know the lyrics. They've been passed down for 3,000 years. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. All of the young women in Israel were in love with David. If they had had mass-produced posters back in those days... David's poster would have been up in the room of every teenager in Israel because this guy, he truly was a rock star. He was even offered the hand of the king's daughter. But there was a catch. And the catch is Saul figured in this way he could get David killed on the field of battle. Finally, it became so horrible. Finally, the attacks were so overt and so vicious that David had to flee for his life. He actually hid out for a period of weeks in the capital city of his enemy, the Philistines. He finally holed up in a cave and then had to move from place to place as King Saul was absolutely relentless in tracking him down and trying to destroy him. If you've ever lived in your life with the opposition of people who are near and dear to you, you can appreciate what David went through. And if you're going through something like that right now, I think it's very easy for us to understand, whoa, what happened to David has some parallels in my life, and I think I need to learn what God's going to have to say to me about this. So let's see what God has to say. It's such a great story now. I, I mean, it, it is filled with profound spiritual truth. But it's also one of the funniest things you will read in 1 Samuel. Here's what we read, chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. This is what the author writes. He says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. 
It's interesting what we don't hear here. Saul had been fighting the Philistines. We have no idea who won. Because frankly, that is not what was on Saul's mind. Saul's mind was not attracted to fighting the enemy. His mind was attracted to fighting David. Saul's concern was not with dealing with the opposition, with the adversary. His desire was to bring down one of his own. And David is now hiding out in the crags of the wild goats at En Gedi. Do you know En Gedi is still there today? It's a fascinating place. It is located just to the west of the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on the face of the globe. It is in an incredibly barren wilderness. But En Gedi stands out because there's a canyon and a series of streams, caves everywhere. It is lush. It is beautiful. It is a great place to hide out. If David still had his full complement of men that are mentioned earlier in 1 Samuel, then there were about 600 of them holed up in the hills at En Gedi. Saul outnumbered him five to one. And David is hiding from the king who desires to bring him down. Then we read this, and I just love this. If I may say, talk about being caught with your pants down. This is what we read. You got that. Some of you have read ahead. Okay. We read these words. It says, verse 3, He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Can't you just picture this? David and his men are hiding out from 3,000 of Saul's crack troops. They're back in the cave, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, in the middle of nowhere, in walks the king all by himself. It's time for a bathroom break. And he has just spotted a perfect rest stop. It's in the midst of beautiful flowing streams. In fact, there is one cave that has been pointed to for many years as the possible cave where David and his men hid out. It's no longer a cave. An earthquake hundreds of years ago destroyed it. But of all the caves at En Gedi, it is the one that is large enough to have held David's 600 men, giant cave, and a stream and a waterfall flow right through the middle of it. Can't you just picture Saul going into a place like that and thinking, phew, it's good to get away from those 3,000 guys and be my myself here. You know, do I, did I bring a book with me to read for a little bit? You know, Saul, Saul wants to just rest and relax, wants to chill, wants to relieve himself. And he has no clue that hiding back in the shadows 600 of David's crack troops and the very man he has sought to kill. David's men say, this is the day that God spoke of. And if you're asking yourself, where in the scripture does it ever say that God spoke to David and told him he's going to get to do whatever he pleases to King Saul? The answer is it's not in there. My guess is David's men were making this one up. They knew that David was going to be king. They knew that God had anointed him as such. They knew that the prophet and priest Samuel had anointed him with oil as, as Israel's future king. But there is nowhere in Scripture where God tells David, go do what you want. David's men are egging him on. And David, in a weak moment, thinks about it and then decides that's not where I'm going to go. He will later rebuke his men. What he does do is with a little bit of an almost juvenile prank, he crawls up behind Saul. And when Saul's robe is down at his feet, that's literally what the Hebrew says. David cuts off a corner of the robe. Now, it is not just any corner. This is where... In looking at the original Hebrew, we see something so amazing and so fascinating. 
David cuts off the kanaf. That's the Hebrew word. The kanaf. One of four wings or corners on every male Israelite's robe. In fact, God had told the Israelites at the time of Moses, in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, this is what the Lord told the Israelites. It says, the Lord said to Moses, this is Numbers 15, verse 37 and following. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at so you will not remember all the commands, so you will remember, excuse me, all the commands of the Lord that you may may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your hearts and eyes. Every Israelite on his robe, on the four corners, the Hebrew word kanaf, was to have a blue tassel And as you walk, those tassels would move with every movement you make. And it was to be an ongoing visual reminder to walk in the path that God has set for you. Not to stray to the right or left, but rather to follow the narrow road, the narrow path that God has laid down for his children. And every day when you've put on your robe, you look down and you see those tassels and you remember... The Lord gave these words to Moses generations ago, and I need to walk humbly before the Lord my God, to love mercy, to act justly, to walk humbly in his presence. Everywhere you go, you look at those blue tassels, and they're a reminder. But you know what can often happen? Is even when there are significant things and reminders in your life, you can get so used to them and so accustomed to them that you forget what they mean. That's exactly what had happened to King Saul. God had raised up Saul to be king over Israel. He had taken him and elevated him in the sight of his fellow Israelites. He called him to walk humbly before God, to lead the people and to protect them from their enemies. Saul had started out well, but pretty soon Saul stopped looking at those blue tassels, even as he stopped listening to the spirit of the living God. And he did things his own way and in his own time and with his own desires. And pretty soon, he actually found himself opposing the very people of God and the man that God had chosen to ultimately lead the children of Israel. And so as David snuck up on Saul in the cave, he snipped off a portion of Saul's robe, not just any portion, but one of those blue tassels at the corner, the kanaf, the wing. Saul finished his business, goes outside, meets with his men. The troops have all assembled. They're getting ready to leave. And at that point, David emerges from the cave. And what we're told is he held up that tassel, that kanaf, that corner of the robe. And basically, this is what he said. Those who have told you that I am out to get you have lied You can see for yourself, God delivered me into your hands. Delivered you, rather, into my hands. But I did not strike you down. And at that point, for the first time ever in 1 Samuel, Saul admits that David is going to be king. And Saul says, you have acted justly, and I have not. Saul is humble and repentant for a moment. It will change later on. But for a moment, he's humble and repentant. And Saul says, God will surely use you to be king of his people, David. Please don't take it out on my family when you come to the kingship. Maybe you ask yourself, well, why did Saul suddenly change I mean, read 1 Samuel chapters 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Saul was absolutely persistent and relentless in trying to kill David, to hunt him down, to make his life miserable. Why does one little cut from the rope suddenly hit home in Saul's life? Now, maybe it's because Saul realized he could have been dead as the proverbial doornail back there in the cave if David had killed him. But maybe it was something else. You see, 
elsewhere in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, or chapter 15, yes, verses 27 and 28. We read these words. Saul, many months earlier, had disobeyed God. And the prophet Samuel had come to him and said, The Lord desires obedience over sacrifice. It's not a matter of going through the motions, King Saul. It's a matter of listening to God and doing what God tells you to do. And Saul finally admits, I've been disobedient. I was more desirous of what people thought of me than I was of what God thought of me. And as Samuel walks away in disgust, Saul says, don't leave me. And he grabs Samuel's robe. Many translations say he grabbed the hem. But the Hebrew word is kanaf. He grabbed the wing of Samuel's robe where the tassel was, and he tore it. And Samuel looked at Saul and said, God has torn the kingdom away from you, and it will go to another whom God has anointed and raised up. I personally believe that is why a single action by David in the cave that almost seems prankish by nature had such a powerful impact on King Saul. Because you see, it was more than just the realization that David could have killed him. It was God revealing something that David probably did not know, but Saul knew full well. And that is... God had prophetically spoken into Saul's life and said, the kingship is going to be taken away from you because of your disobedience. And for the first time ever, Saul admits it and says, that's true. Because you see, when God's people do God's thing, God's way, God often moves in ways that we would never have imagined possible. And that is at the heart of forbearance. You see, the Lord calls his children to behave in a way that is absolutely consistent with his character, not our own. To not imitate the ways of the world, but rather to walk humbly before the Lord our God. And when we do, incredible things happen. So let's explore that now in the time that we have remaining. Two fundamental truths from 1 Samuel 24 and for that matter, from Genesis to Revelation. Two fundamental truths that affect everything in our lives and everything we do and that speak so powerfully especially in those times in our lives when we're ready to say, I can't bear it anymore. Truth number one, we're going to put it right up here on the screen. Belief begets behavior. And by that I mean this. When we believe in the living God, when we understand that God is God, that he is greater than any of the issues in our lives, greater than any of the struggles that we go through, when we understand that his love for us is greater than the opposition of the enemy, when we understand and comprehend and internalize the truth that God so loved the world he gave his one and only son, that God so loved me, That he was willing to take all of the punishment, all of the pain, all of the abuse that I should have deserved and willingly bore that on a cross. Then that changes everything and all of a sudden that belief, that belief begets behavior. Because you see the Christian faith is more than simply knowing the gospel truth. It's knowing the gospel truth. It's one thing to be able to recite John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It is another thing to say, oh Lord God, I thank you that you love me so much and that you endured that for me and that even though I was your enemy, while I was still your enemy, you came and offered yourself up for me. 
And when my enemies come up against me, as painful as that is, it doesn't begin to compare with the agony my Lord Jesus endured for me. And therefore, that changes everything because that belief begets behavior. Here is what the scripture says in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. In fact, can you read that from back there? 1 Peter. Or 1 Peter, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Another one of the disciples. <laughs> Different book. But they're both really good. <laughs> anyway, 1 Peter chapter 2. If you can read that, would you read it with me? When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Listen to these words in their context. This is what John writes. He said, John, not Peter. Peter, not John. Thank you. I, I actually did get an extra hour of sleep last night. Thank you for keeping me on track, though. I truly do appreciate that. I don't know where John's coming from, but... Uh, Anyway, here's what Peter says. He says, In this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Then, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. I want to be with the shepherd and overseer of my soul. And at that point, when I am hurting so deeply that I'm crying out to God, I can't bear it any longer. I want my attention focused not on my pain, but on my Lord's love. I want my attention focused not on the opposition. I want my attention focused on the God who delivers his children, who keeps his word, who will bring to, to fulfillment everything that he has promised. That's what David understood. Now, please note, David was not foolish. You know, many times the enemy loves to turn this around. And he'll say, well, are they, are they coming after you and making your life miserable? Well, you deserve it. And, you know, if you're a really follower of Jesus, you just take it and let them hit you as much as they, they desire. That's not what David did. David fled. David tried to deal with it for a time. But finally, it became so obvious, he got out of there. He went into the cave. He hid. But at no time did David allow the pain of his life to take his eyes off the living God. And so even when Saul came into the cave, don't you just love those coincidences? There are no coincidences with God. We've said it before. The word coincidence is not found anywhere in the Bible. But even when Saul came into the cave, David looked to the Lord rather than to his pain. He cut off the kanaf, the wing, the tassel. Probably had no idea how powerfully that would speak to King Saul. He behaved honorably. And that leads us to the second truth. Truth number one, belief begets behavior. Truth number two, blessing brings benefits. Blessing brings benefits. What does David do? He actually blesses Saul. He holds him accountable. He says, King Saul, you can take a look at what's going on here and everyone can see the truth. I am not coming after you. I am not your enemy. But Saul also blesses the king. And that's what the Lord Jesus causes us and calls us to do. 
what he enables us to do. And I might add, as Peter, please note that, as Peter put it, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, he says, again, feel free to read with me, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. And isn't that exactly what happened to David? He didn't return evil for evil. He didn't try to one-up Saul on the insult meter. Instead, he blessed. And in the end, he received a blessing. And the blessing was everything God had promised came through. Everything the Lord had said was true. Everything God said he would do, he did. Everything God offered to David, he fulfilled. Everything the enemy took away, God restored. Everything the enemy sought to destroy by death, God brought new life to it. And that's what God does. And that's what he will do in your life and in mine. And when we are crying out from the very depths of our hearts, Lord, I can't bear it any longer. God is saying, he bore in his own body our sin. And because he did, I can live differently. Not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but rather in the strength that God gives and in the power of the indwelling spirit of the living God, because of the shed blood of Jesus, my Savior, because of the mercy of the living God who has redeemed us and restored us and will bring us to the final fulfillment at the end of days, we can love mercy, act justly, walk humbly before the Lord our God. Because ultimately, this is not about us. It's about him and the pains in our lives and the unjust attacks, the bitterness and the sorrows. God says, I'm even going to take those things and turn them around for good in your life. Do you realize that? I consider the sufferings we go through at this present time, the apostle Paul writes, to not be worth comparing with the glory that God will reveal in us. For in all things, God works together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And my dear friend, if today the wound is wide open in your life, if the scab has been picked and removed, if the pain goes deep, hear God speaking to you. A word of love and mercy in Jesus, your Savior and mine. A word of healing and hope from His word of truth. A word of encouragement that says, the enemy is not going to win this time. The enemy is not going to take you down. Instead, God who is good and great and powerful is the God who is going to lift up his children and bring you up into the heavenly places so that you will experience resources from him you did not know possible. Divine resources. Weapons of defense and offense. Not to hurt or to harm, but to heal and to help. Not to kill and destroy, but to bring life and bring hope. Words that change us from the inside out so that even in the face of greatest opposition, we can walk boldly with the Lord our God at our side and know that the battle belongs to the Lord, the victory is His, and therefore, therefore, we are not going to give in to evil. We will not fight evil with evil. We will instead fight evil with good. We will not try to play a game of one-upmanship with insults. We will instead speak the truth. A truth that is at times painful, but a truth that always, always points to the living God and calls people back to Him. A truth that has the power to penetrate the soul of even the most hostile foe.
And God did that through David with Saul. By the corner of a rope. By a kanaf with the tassels. In Hebrew, kanaf the tzitzit. Kanaf and the tassels. God does remarkable things. And he's inviting you and me to live differently. Differently from the world. Differently from even those who sometimes profess to be his followers. He calls us to live the way he has summoned his children to live. By faith in Christ. The belief that begets behavior. And the blessing the blessing that brings benefits, not just to those who have sought to harm, but to us. Because you know one of the things that happens when you and I turn the other cheek, when you and I do not repay evil with evil or curses with curses, we emerge from that even stronger and we are blessed and God smiles and he brings healing even to the most open wound and even to the most painful hurt. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord God, we are in absolute awe of you. We're in awe of your word because your word is true and it speaks in such mighty ways to our hearts and our souls. But above all else, Lord, we are in awe of you your goodness, your mercy, your holiness, your awesome power. Oh Lord, as you have shown such incredible love to each of us and given healing and hope through Jesus our Savior, may we receive that with faith and with joy and with confidence. May we also act on that, Lord. The belief, the belief that truly does beget behavior and the blessing that truly does bring benefits to others and to us, to the glory of your name. Amen.